Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is week 10, day one of our study of 1st and 2nd Timothy. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're talking about 2nd Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Welcome back to the 10 Week Bible Study. Again, I'm your host, Darren Hibbs. Before we get started, I want to encourage you to check out all the resources we have over at 10weekbible.com. We need to know the Bible now more than ever. So it may be your time to start leading a Bible study group at your church or in your small group in your home. With that, let's go ahead and pray before we start today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to what your word has to say to us? God, speak to us and fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. We want to encounter you through your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With that, let's jump into God's Word. I'll be reading today from the NIV. This is 2 Timothy 4, starting in verse 1. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the Word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Let's stop right there. So this is the beginning of, of our final chapter, but it's the, it's, it's the beginning of the final thought. And again, in the original context, the original letter and, and languages, there were no chapters and verses. But this is most definitely the beginning of these final thoughts that Paul has for Timothy. And as we're going to see shortly in this chapter, Paul believes this to be the last thing that he's going to write to Timothy in hoping that Timothy is going to come see him in person. But just in case, because you never know, I mean, it's not like you can get on a plane back then and be halfway around the world in 12 to 24 hours. For Timothy to come visit Paul, it may take more time than Paul has on this earth. And so he knows that this could potentially be the last communication. Who knows? Paul may be dead before this letter even gets to him. But, you know, those are, those are realities in this day and time. And so he's writing this last thing to Timothy and he's, he's telling him, and, and we know that Timothy is a, is a pastor. He's a leader in the church. And so Paul is, is giving him this charge, preach. But not just preach. Don't preach encouragement. Don't preach positivity or whatever. I mean, it's not that that's a bad thing. He says, preach the word. Preach God's word. And he tells him, be prepared in season and out of season. Now, I've heard people talk about how, you know, we should never prepare what we're going to say. We should just let the Holy Spirit speak through us. And that is a scripture, but it's Jesus telling his disciples, listen, don't worry about preparing, you know, an argument for when you're taken to court, right? He says, when you're persecuted and people are going to say, hey, because you're a believer, but because you believe this, Right In Paul's case, he's in chains because of his be- belief in Jesus, because of his belief in, in, in Christianity. Jesus is very specific. He says, when that happens, don't prepare anything to say ahead of time. He says, when you're dragged in front of courts and magistrates and, and leaders, like don't, don't figure out what you're going to say ahead of time. Let the Holy Spirit speak through you in that moment. He says, the Holy Spirit will give you words in those moments. Don't prepare anything ahead of time. That's a very specific charge, and it's about a very specific you know, moment in your life, and it's not a, a charge to just say you should always just be extemporaneous and you should never prepare anything. You should never, you, you should never be prepared to talk about scripture and all of this stuff. You just let the Holy Spirit flow through you. You know, and, and there's times where just pure Holy Spirit extemporaneous teaching, maybe that has its place occasionally. But I, I don't think you can find anywhere in Scripture where just pure extemporaneous teaching, meaning no preparation, no, you know, no sermon prep, no, no time in the Word trying to figure out how are you going to say this, what are you going to, what are you going to explain, what's the background behind all this. You don't find that anywhere in Scripture when it's talking about preaching the Word. It's talking about teaching the Word. Nowhere, nowhere. There's this this idea, this Old Testament concept of you know study to show yourself approved before the Lord is is that if if we're going to be teaching, this is an Old and New Testament concept by the way. But if we're going to be teaching, we have to you know study the Word, go through it. And again, there's a distinction that I like to make between reading and studying. 
If you are are not actively teaching something, you need to be reading God's word, getting it in you. If you're preparing to teach it, there's a place for study in that. And so Paul is telling Timothy, preach the word and be prepared at all times, in season and out of season. Now, I don't know what out of season is for preaching. I don't think there's a preaching season and and the off season, right? It's not like the football season where... You know, you've you've had an awesome season each game. You know, you've preached that season, and then, you know, it's time to rest and, and recuperate. I, I don't think preaching has an off season like sports, but I think he's making the point here that, you know, in in times when it feels necessary, in times when it doesn't, be prepared. Right, be, be pouring over God's word, and be ready to speak about it at all times. That's the charge he's giving to Timothy as a leader, as a teacher, as a preacher. And I think that's something that that every leader, every teacher should take to heart. Now, again, if if that's not the calling that the Lord has given to you, I would encourage you. I would say, you know, it's not that you shouldn't ever study, but, and, and I think this is true for even preachers and teachers, is that most of our engagement with scripture should be reading it not studying it. This goes for everyone, preachers and teachers included. We should read so much more than we study. We should have so much more time reading than we do studying. And for those of, of, of you, those of us that, that are not going to be actively teaching, I would say leave the study for a rare occasion. Read it, get it in you, read it over and over and over again. That alone will transform your experience with God's word and and with God so much. I think one of the things that we find with the Pharisees, and there's a lot of things going on with them more than just this one thing, but one of the things that we find with the Pharisees, and we see it today too, is that if you try to study God's word, meaning you read a little verse and then you look at Greek and Hebrew sources and you look at commentaries and you look at all of this other stuff, you Google stuff and you start coalescing all this information and trying to figure out about a little bit of, of God's word, a little bit of scripture here and there. And you're doing you know word studies, you're going deep on all of this kind of stuff and trying to figure it out without just reading it, without just understanding the concept con, uh, context. And, and not just the context, but getting it in you, like having God's word in you over and over and over again, you, you start getting all this nitpicky study about things. And, and I've seen so many people come to some very unbiblical, very strange conclusions about things just because they don't know God's word enough. They know lots of other people's thoughts, lots of commentaries, lots of other things, but they don't know God's word so much of that can be avoided if we just read, just read it, get it in us. And I think a big chunk of being prepared in and out of season to preach the word is having read it so much. Read it over and over and over again. And then it's just in you. You can't help but to think and meditate on God's word when you do that. And, and that by and of itself can be one of the greatest preparations that any preacher, any teacher can have. He also tells us that we should use it to correct and rebuke and encourage people, right? Nowadays, the best-selling authors, the best-selling preachers, TV preachers, there's mostly encouragement or almost entirely encouragement, no correction or rebuking. Now, to be fair, nobody wants to be corrected. Nobody wants to be rebuked. And, and a sermon from a pulpit or anywhere where you're really calling out one person or, or one group of people. I mean, this happens a lot. Pastors and leaders do this. We've probably all seen videos or experienced this before. This is not okay, right? You don't use the, the pulpit, the sermon as a bully pulpit to manipulate people within a congregation. You should never do that. So when we're talking about correcting and rebuking, we don't do that to one individual person from the pulpit. That's not biblical. That's not Christian. If there is someone who needs rebuking and correcting, we go to them. The Bible is very clear on this. We go to them and, and we meet with them. If they refuse, then we get some other believers with us and we go to them. And then if they refuse, then they are to be dealt with in a more 
public setting, but still not as, as an aside or a, a mention in a sermon or something like that. That's never okay. Never, never, never. But there are times where there's correction and rebuke. And there are times where in preaching the word, that's necessary. If there's societal ills or things going on that are more broad, where you're not targeting at one specific person, then yes, we need to, to be able to do that from sermons. Now, again, that's not popular in our cultural context right now, but it's very necessary. And we should take that to heart. All right, verse three. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. I'm going to pause right there. I understand the irony of what I am doing here. Right? This is a, a, a podcast Bible study online. Nearly every single one of you listening and watching this have found it through searching for Bible studies online. You're, you're looking for someone to teach God's word, some, some way to engage in God's word. And I appreciate that. And I get the irony of this because I could be thought of as one of those other voices, right? That's, you know, people are searching that there's a, there's a democratization of God's word through the internet nowadays. There's so many churches. We can go from one church to another until we find one that we like what the pastor says and how he teaches and what he teaches. We can go online and find sermons from thousands of different churches, from thousands of different podcasts like this until we find the one that suits us the best. And there's an extreme danger in that. There's an extreme danger in that, right? We are living in in the days where it, it doesn't take the technology, right? It doesn't take the internet. It doesn't take all of this stuff for for people throughout history to have been able to find someone to to soothe them with what their itching ears want to hear. Technology is not necessary. There's always been cases. There's stories in the Bible, right, where they you know hire different people to come in and 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 speak what they want. Uh, there's a famous story in the book of Judges where a wealthy man does just that with a Levite and asks him to come and be his own personal priest and kind of teach him whatever he wants to hear. Nothing new. It was it existed in Paul's day, it exists now, and it doesn't need the internet to happen. There's churches, they can fire the pastor that they've got and hire a new pastor that will say the things that they want to hear, right? But the the democratization of of almost everything through the internet and and the availability, not even the democratization, but the availability on the internet of, of anything you want to hear anytime you want to hear it, that, that is a a big X factor here. And, and again, I get the irony that I could be one of those voices in my heart is that I stay true to God's word as best as possible. And when it's impossible not to have biases. It's impossible not to have thoughts and opinions about these things. And when we come to, you know, relatively uh, hot topics about these things, I try to at least make my bias clear and have done a little research on what other people's biases are and and express them. Because my heart with these studies is not that you would come away from them knowing what Darren Hibbs thinks more than anything else. I want you to be fascinated by his word. And if you come away with a different conclusion than me about different things, I'm fine with that as long as you're filling your mind with God's word. If you're filling your mind with God's word over and over and over again, you come away with a different opinion, I don't care. My main goal is that you fill your mind with God's word in these things. But we are certainly living in a time where, and again, this has always been the case, but there's an explosion of availability to gather around ourselves, as Paul says, a great number of teachers. That's the difference, right? That's the difference. That's one of those things that makes us makes people think, are we in the end times? Are we are rapidly heading toward the end times? Because it's that availability. Right? Throughout history, again, there's always been the availability to get rid of the pastor and, and bring in a new pastor that says the things that they want. But to have a great number of teachers around us, that's hard without that technological X factor of the internet and TV and all of those things. And we have that now. And we see that, 
right? The, we, we live in these siloed communities online now, uh, the echo chamber, as they say, on social media and online, where we people really only listen to the people that they want to listen to. Now, we don't talk to people with differing opinions. We don't talk to people about different things. So if if you want a very conservative biblical view on things, you go to a church like that, you listen to things like that online, you don't engage with other people. If you want a progressive liberal view of of scripture, and I'm not speaking politically liberal, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in a, a biblical theological perspective. If, if you want a, a, a liberal progressive theological perspective on things, you go to those churches and you engage with those people online and you don't really ever talk to other people. And so we've been able to heap up for ourselves, regardless of whether or not you think you're right or wrong. We have a great number of teachers that will say what our itching ears want to hear. We're there. We're there. I'm positive that as we approach the actual end times more and more, whether it's now or sometime in the future, (coughs) excuse me, that that will grow. Verse five, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. I like this thing that he says, keep your head in all situations. When, when things get crazy, when, when there's all of this nonsense, right? When, when you have these siloed communities, people want to fight, people get angry. That's what we see right now online. And it's very easy to get sucked into one of those silos. And there's plenty of them. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't get sucked into one of those silos and become an us versus them. <clears throat> don't get sucked into a tribe. You keep your head. You keep, ground, you, you keep yourself rooted and grounded in God's word. Not anybody's tribe, not anybody's online silo. Keep your head in all those situations. Endure whatever hardship. And I like what he says here, do the work of an evangelist. Paul's saying, I know you're not an evangelist, Timothy. I know you're not good at it, but do it anyway. There are many of us that are not good at evangelism. I am not. (coughs) Excuse me. There have been so many times where I've witnessed to people over and over and over again. And no result. And then I will have a friend who I know is spiritually gifted as an evangelist. And and they will just come into the presence of these people that I have witnessed to on many, many occasions. And without saying too many words, these people just want to get saved in these uh, people with uh, evangelism giftings in their presence. I have seen it so many times. I'm not good at evangelism. I have empirical data to back that up. But it doesn't mean that I should not be evangelizing. That's the thing that Paul says here. Timothy, I know you're not an evangelist. You're a preacher. You're a teacher. But do the work of an evangelist too. Like, do that. Right? Don't don't let that slide. And it may be that an evangelist, 90% of the people that they encounter on a regular basis, they get saved. It's not that high. It's not, it's not like that. But let's just say 90% of the people that they witness to, they get saved. And maybe 1% of the people that I witnessed to get saved. But if that 1% never encounters that evangelist, then that 1% doesn't get saved unless I'm evangelizing to them. So it matters. It really, really does matter. Even when we're no good at this, it really matters that we engage in it. And I pray that you and I will make a point to engage in evangelism as often as we can, as often as we think about it as often as the Lord will give us grace to say yes to it. For the 10-Week Bible Study, I'm your host, Aaron Hibbs, and I can't wait to see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the 10-Week Bible Study. If you've enjoyed this, would you consider doing that whole like and subscribe and bell thing you're always hearing people talk about? It really helps other people find out about the show, and my heart is for people to fall in love with God's Word. Thank you. Thank you.